Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another Roll20 review, my written video review series, where I take a look at the marketplace section of online role-playing website Roll20.net. With this video, we'll be looking at Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the brand new latest Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition campaign from Wizards of the Coast. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to my platinum patrons, Andrew and Brian, and gold patrons, RPG Paper Crafts. Thank you so much for your support. So, as we switch on over to me, hello. It has been a solid year since Tomb of Annihilation, which was the last big 5th edition campaign book. Normally, they were, they've been on a six-month schedule, Wizards has, for several years now with 5th edition, and we have waited patiently for a year for the new adventure, and it is here, and i got to say that my knee-jerk reaction is not great, which is a bit surprising, because I am a big fan of D&D 5th edition, specifically 5th edition. I've been kind of on and off with D&D over the years, but we've, me and my friends have all really gotten into... 5th edition, and particularly we've gotten into the published adventures quite a bit. I thought they've been really high quality and a really great way for DMs to be able to jump into the world without knowing a lot of the Forgotten Realms stuff and uh, have all that information in place, but still be, you know, modular and moddable to be able to work in your own stories and plot lines and whatever you want, but use it as a baseline pretty effectively. Um, that being said, Dragon Heist has... Two big things that shocked me right off the bat, and I'll go ahead and get into them before I do my breakdown. The first is that the maps are bad. <laughs> I can understand why some people might like the style that they chose to do. I th I was horrified. I will go ahead and say I was horrified when I saw these maps. Uh, I'm a big fan of like Mike Schley's art and just the art style that they've kind of cultivated with all of these campaign books and all the rich detail they've had, and particularly works well with somebody like me who pretty much runs all of D&D through Roll20 and digital tabletop formats, so you need, like, you know, good quality maps work really well. There are certainly, there's groups out there who enjoy D&D who never use a map. It's all theater of the mind. More power to you. That's awesome. Uh, and then maybe, you know, that'll be obviously less of a, of a factor for you for this adventure, but if you like maps you are going to have a big problem with Dragon Heist, I suspect, as I did, and I will show you why uh, in a bit. The other problem is, and this is a weird thing, because in 5th edition, the very first adventure, which was the um, the dragon one, the Tyranny of Dragons was split, the, that storyline was split into two books. It was uh, Horde of the, as I lean over to check my shelf, Horde of the Dragon Queen, and... What the hell was the other one? The Rise of Tiamat. Jeez. Um, <laughs> I literally went and checked my D&D &D shelf. Uh, and, and those were split up between literally a first half of that adventure and a second half, which was fine because they wanted to get that first campaign book out earlier, basically. What this one does is it also splits the adventure between essentially this Waterdeep Dragon Heist and then the other one is the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which would be the big Undermountain Dungeon. And we don't, at least I'm not privy to, obviously, what's going to be in that second half of the module, the campaign, so it's hard for me to look at the whole thing, you know, together. So I, for the purpose of this review, I'm just looking at this one as a complete adventure. And while it does have technically a beginning, middle, and end, the characters end at fifth level. Fifth level, which basically puts this as the same scope of, like, Lost Mine of Fandover. Which is a great adventure. I love that adventure. It's it's in the starter set and it's been lauded, correctly so, as this amazing, uh, jumping off starter adventure for new players and just a good adventure in general. So that doesn't necessarily make this bad, but this is priced the same as you know Tomb of Annihilation and Storm King's Thunder and and the whatever the Underdark one was and Curse of Strahd. All of those which take the players anywhere from like 11th to 15th level and feel like full you know, year-plus-long campaigns where you go on this epic journey through all these levels and everything, which is what D&D is all about. And this one, just reading through the stuff that happens and the fact that you stay in that Tier 1 low level the whole time really just feels like you are vastly limiting the scope of what this adventure is, and it doesn't quite feel like this epic 
cool story or adventure that I was expecting. I think part of that is because you pretty much stay in the low levels. Like, there's not a whole lot of space you can explore given that limitation of you're basically in tier one the whole time. So those are my two biggest problems. So off the bat, I'm being very negative. There are some really good qualities about this, and we're going to explore that for sure. But I had to get that off my chest because I was actually pretty, you know, I was coming in here honestly expecting to just be blown away and impressed as I have been with all of their products up to this point, basically. I mean, some of the themes have, have um, spoken to me more than others, um, for sure. And I think some campaigns are easier to run than others, for sure. But they've all been really good products that I think have been worth the time. And this is the first one where I'm really like, hmm, hmm, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting more critical, but I'm really, I just really wasn't feeling this one. But let's... Let's go over uh, the content that is included. This is, again, specifically the Roll20 module, which is, is, for all intents and purposes, the same thing that you get in the written book. Um, I'll go over whatever few, like, additions or changes that they've made. And But, you know, unfortunately, if you're doing it on Roll20, you have to also purchase this module. If you, you know, the physical book, there's no kind of tie-in there. But if you're normally, if you're playing something in Roll20, it's way worth for DMs to purchase these modules. I've been very positive on all of their uh, efforts so far in terms of translating them, getting the uh, dynamic lighting in there already, get the tokens in there, the character sheets. It is such a big time saver that if you are planning to run any of these adventures, and really Dragon Heist would be included in that, then yes, I would in I would recommend getting this module. But I'm not sure I would recommend this module in general, <laughs> like ahead of any of the other modules, frankly. All right, so... The following content is included in the 4995 Waterdeep Dragon Heist module on Roll20. You get four add-ons, and this is part of what makes this adventure kind of unique, is the latter, I'm going to say third, is divided up into four separate paths that really the DM ends up choosing. I'm going to go into this later, but... Essentially, Roll20 has set it up as an add-on to where you only load the ones that you're using into that adventure, which doesn't load the others. And the reason they do that is because the, it, the latter sections basically remix these final few areas, these not even full dungeons, they're, just like, they're literally areas, and they use them in different ways. So, like, there might be a chase scene in this one, there might be a hostage situation if you follow this path, whereas in this path, it's actually where the... Uh, vault of dragons is located like underneath that one and it's a completely different setup so it actually vastly changes what you're doing um, so you end up using those same maps but all the tokens so the nice thing is by by splitting them up into add-ons there's no confusion there they didn't it's not like they put all the tokens on the map with you know GM layer and said okay here's the spring here's the summer and you have to know which ones to do they literally just did okay whichever one you want to use you load that one into your main module and then that's the one that you can use and I think that's a great way of doing it and a nice uh, bonus but it also speaks to how weird the adventure is and, and I, I also didn't like that part of Storm King's Thunder which is when the players choose like okay which one of these like excellent big dungeons do you want to use and the others you just do not use at all that just feels weird when they when, when you get content in the campaign book that specifically says, okay, here's a bunch of content, but you're only going to use 25% of it. That I, that never sits quite well with me. I would rather say, okay, here's all the content, and you can pick and choose which ones you want to use that fit your storyline in terms of here's all the side quests and all the main quests and all that stuff you want to use, and not like, you know, here's the gated section of content that we want you to use. It doesn't seem well. Anyway, but that's how they set it up in, in Roll20. Uh, you also get so the weird thing is, I'm, I'm about to give you the stats on the maps, and the maps is, it includes all of the maps, and some of them, depending on which module you're loading, you're not going to see at all, whereas other ones will be changed up, but total, you get 16 5-foot battle maps, and all the all these maps have dynamic lighting for subscribers and options for Advanced Fog of War, all those bells and whistle, whistles that are in Roll20. But again, you're not you're not actually going to see all those maps because you're only going to because of the way the adventure is structured, you only see 25% of the last third. I'm not a math person, so whatever that you know. So there's there are certain maps, especially there's a there's a big grand villain layer for each villain, and you're only going to get one of those depending on which path the players take. So you're not going to see all those maps. Four 10 foot battle maps that have been half scaled to five feet, one 20 foot map that has been half scaled to 10 feet, and then one non gridded, uh, non scaled city map, which is of course water deep. So the map scaling is good. I will say that with the Wizards has had very much 
problems with map scaling in the past, specifically on things like Storm King's Thunder, where everything was just fucking gigantic and did not look very good on uh, on Roll20 when they have to do the half, you know, tokens and make them real small. Most of the maps are five foot maps, which is good, but I've not shown you what those maps look like yet, so you might not care. <laughs> uh, 73 unique M unique and named NPC character sheets with matching tokens and GM descriptions, 49 of which have pictures and player handout. That's very cool. And this, obviously, it takes place entirely in a city, so you want to have, you know, all those... There's a lot of opportunity for talking with people. There's a huge role-playing aspect to this adventure, a lot of social encounters and dialogue, and it's very satisfying. There's obviously a ton of characters there to use. Uh, 118 generic NPC monster sheets, all of which have the draggable tokens, the vision setup, player handouts, all those bells and whistles, which is very good to have. 64 magic item player handouts, only 30 of which have pictures and handouts. That seems pretty standard from all the reviews I've done uh, in terms of they'll give you a lot of magic items, but not everything has an uh, associated picture with it. Even the DM uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, I think, is where all the, most of these magic item pictures, you know, they only have for maybe half, if not less, of the actual items are given pictures. Uh, you get an alphabetized token page of all NPCs and creatures. Again, that's very standard with all these Roll20 uh, paid modules. You get relevant supplemental rules from the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook, and the Dragon Heist books. So there'll be like the Chase Complications page from the Dungeon Master's Guide. That's in there because there's a lot of chase sequences, like that kind of thing. If it's something that specifically comes up in this adventure, there'll be that note there in the journal that you can use, although I believe everything is also in the compendium that you can just look up also. Uh, you get extra notes and... Oh, wait, I skipped ahead. Uh, rollable tables for optional random encounters, chase complications, and rollable tokens for shapeshifters. So, also very standard. You just get the uh, the different macros where you can roll on... Uh, any, anytime there's a table. And then also the shapeshifting tokens, they have rollable tokens. So you go to the multi-sided and you can switch those tokens around, which is very very cool to have it also has a uh, a gm uh, specific page that is like a campaign tracker kind of similar to what they did with the tyranny of dragons uh, module where it's like uh, you can keep track of where the players are although this one's a lot simpler than tyranny of dragons it's just literally i think you can put a token let's go ahead and switch to that uh, and i can show you what that looks like my roll 20 has been lagging like crazy today i don't know if it's me or them so i apologize for how uh, frustrating that you can see like right here uh, um, clicking there we go so it's a flow chart of <laughs> even gives you a little token that you can move <laughs> for whatever reason uh, look at that lag good lord um, but it follows the uh, you know what chapter you're currently in which I don't <laughs> you don't really need to have a token hopefully track that but I guess it's nice to have a visualization here. It tracks um, other little bits, the holidays that can occur in Waterdeep. Uh, this is like a summary of what happened prior to the adventure starting, uh, which is good to have all that spelled out. And then the encounter chains by season. So the way it's split up between um, how chapter, basically how chapter four, I think it's just chapter four. I think chapter five is literally just an optional. Well, chapter five through whatever eight, because they actually split it up between the different villain layers. Um, but this is the important part here, is the chains by season. This is the actual... Essentially, for being an urban adventure, it's actually pretty linear the way the main quest works. It's like these things happen one after the other pretty quickly, each one, to where like you're chasing somebody and then they escape into this area and then you get them and then this other faction appears and takes it and then you go to this area. Like It's all very much like a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back once these things start happening, which I believe is Chapter 4. And you can use this little party tracker to drag them along and see like where exactly they are. Um, and I don't think they're meant to go like side to side. I think you're really supposed to take one column and stick to it because if you notice, let's see if I can find an example here. So like in autumn, Jarlaxle has got the theater as just an encounter here, whereas for the spring, for the Xanathar, the theater is actually the final encounter because that's where the Vault of Dragons is. The Vault of Dragons is actually located in a different area depending on which storyline you chose, which... Again, it's weird that they decided to do it that way. The only way I can see the advantage of it is if you're a DM and you are running this specific adventure for multiple groups, then it's more enjoyable, I guess, for you <laughs> because you're not having to run the exact same thing again. Although the first, like, two-thirds of the adventure is the same no matter what. You're just, you, they get to, like, third level or that chapter four and it's everything happened the same. And then you as the DM basically just choose, okay, who was the actual villain behind all this? 
and it's one of these four and then from there it actually does change what happens in chapter four and beyond but it's very odd because even the pcs aren't really making that choice it's actually unlike storm kings where i think they are making that choice about which giants to go after it's you as the dm i believe making that choice about who do you want to just have be the main villain and then the plot can go from there which is bizarre um so chapter one is a nice introduction it is um Volo, our good friend Volo from Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, who was also, I believe, is seen in Tomb of Annihilation briefly as a random encounter uh, in Port Nine Zaru. Volo uh, just introdu- and gives the players an opening quest. They're level one. They're all meeting at the Yawning Portal, which is the famous uh, tavern that next to the uh, Undermountain Dungeon, which seems like a really terrible security risk. Uh, and it actually springs a really terrible fight on you in that this troll just climbs out of the yawning uh, let's see there's a actual good picture i can go to it's that it's been shared around quite a bit but it's this nice artwork which i believe is jason thompson is in his name who does all these um cool stylized art and they have all these uh, like old uh, classic adventures and campaign modules uh it's really really fun artwork here of the yawning portal which is really cool but yeah there's a nice little representation of the actual portal going into the undermountain uh, and there's, like, a sequence where a troll climbs out and just fights, like, everybody in the tavern, and the players are supposed to, like, help fight in that, but it, it seems like it's mainly an excuse for the retired uh, barman, um, what is his name, Dagon or something, Dagon wields his great sword and chops the troll apart. Fine. Um, but Valo um, just gives the players the quest to rescue his friend. His drinking buddy, essentially, uh, never came home one night, and he suspects something bad happened to him, and the players have to investigate that, and uh, chapter one is them picking up the pieces of this investigation. And really, it's, you know, it's called a dragon heist, but it's not actually a heist at all. It is a, it's it's the classic crime MacGuffin thing. There's an item that is like changing hands left and right. And people want this item because it is basically the key to finding this vault of vault the vault of dragons which is this hidden vault underneath waterdeep that's got thousands of gold placed there embezzled from um a prior masked lord of waterdeep uh and essentially the players are uh, valo's friend is also friends with the son of that masked lord never remember uh, and things get entwined. I'm not gonna go too much into the into the plot details, but it's it's not too bad. It's it's a fun little plot. That first one is kind of mistaken identity. You find him like hiding in a warehouse, the friend, and then the friend's like, oh my my friend got kidnapped. The actual you know they thought they thought that uh or no, you find you find the uh you find the the son uh, hiding out, and he says that the Valo's friend. They they thought they was me because they thought I was the, you know he was the son, and you have to go find him, and that takes you to this uh, Xanathar Guild hideout. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you the maps now. You probably already glimpsed these when I was switching around, but, uh, you know, first thing I do when I'm looking at a Roll20 uh, campaign or module is I look at the maps, because the maps are nice and cool. This is not nice or cool. This is not nice or cool at all. This is, this is black, just black ink doodles on graph paper. And I hate it. I hate it a lot. <laughs> um, let's go to the Xanathar Guild one. Okay, so... This, to me, is just inexcusable for a Wizards of the Coast produced $50 book slash Roll20. And, you know, and Roll20, you know, for the most part, they're not making the maps. They are using whatever the Wizards maps are, so I'm not faulting them for this. I'm faulting wizards for this. I don't like this style. I think, and I get this used to be a style of D and D. You know, when D and D was much smaller and and had, you know, it was this style. And, and this is kind of you know, there's a quaintness to it about like you know, literally like drawing in a in a notebook, drawing graph paper, and that's a very classic style. That is not at all what I want from an actual professionally produced you know fifty dollar uh, book. However, an adventure book. Uh, and you can see it's even got the you know the dyma- dynamic lighting's in place with little doors you can move to open things up and all that's fine. But this does not look good at all. My players would not like this. I do not like this. I think it looks 
bad and for roll 20s purposes where you're all sitting here on a map together looking at the map the whole time that's bad news uh so these individual dungeon maps are not good now this is not a dungeon heavy adventure by any stretch so the one advantage i guess is that this is the least map intensive adventure that wizards has probably ever produced a lot of these situations and quests and events that happen do not use maps at all. The beginning, this is an example of one that does because you end up chasing this, uh, rescuing this character as Volo's friend, uh, Floon, uh, which is a neat scene here with an intellect devourer who's like petting, uh, 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 what do you call it, Illithid, who's uh, like petting an intellect devourer like as the lair and he has to like flee and all that. That's kind of fun. Um, but you can tell this is obviously a level one dungeon. There's just some goblins everywhere and that's like a single were rat over here. Uh, there's not much going on. And again, and that's kind of true of the whole adventure. The, the players stay pretty low level to where they can't really do much here in terms of the threat level and the dungeons and the complications and things like that. It's a lot of social stuff, which is fine. It's just not really going to be my cup of tea, necessarily. Um, but they rescue Volo's friend, and Volo's um, rewards them with their own place basically like this rundown uh tavern in troll skull alley uh called troll skull manor uh which basically kicks off chapter two and uh that part's actually pretty cool i like the fact that that's a really good way of of tying the characters into Waterdeep, making them care about the city make them care about following the rules there's a big part and this is mentioned throughout the adventure is that uh water has a law system like, unlike a lot of, you know, rural villages or whatever, and especially once the players level up a bit, they player characters, I think, tend to be able to throw their weight around a little bit more and think they can get away with a lot more. At least, you know, I can't speak for everyone's group, but it certainly seems that once they reach a certain power level of, like, fourth or fifth, and they're not, you know, assuming they're not in the middle of a big city or something, then they feel like they can kind of get away. You know, the rogues want to steal from everybody, or people want to push other people around and intimidate and kind of be the, you know, the, the what's the, not the pair, the renegade options of uh, Mass Effect. Um, which is, you know, you can still be heroes, but be kind of dicks about it, I guess. This one has a very strict thing about, uh, the rules and the, uh, you, you have to follow the law, basically. I can't find the actual note in here, but it's, I think it's actually down low. Look at this lag, by the way. Come on, roll 20. Um, but there's, there's a whole section about, um... Uh, f uh, fines and and punishments and uh, limitations that are put on the I might have put it in supplemental rules I don't remember um, but there is a handout somewhere that I'm not gonna be able to find while I'm talking about it uh, that basically gives like punishment it gives like here's if you assault a noble it's death if you do this then it's a fine if you do that and there's notes on just about every event that happens that the players can get in big trouble, and it even says at one point, like, the players, if they get in big enough trouble, like, they will not be able to complete this adventure. They will be thrown in prison for, you know, years or whatever it is. So, like, if you're... there, I feel like there definitely needs to be a session zero where you need to explain to your players, like, the law is a thing, and you need to follow the law or be very, very careful with very, very few, like, you know, and it's obviously up to the DM how lenient you want to be on stuff. And, you know, I would I would let the players get chance to have, you know, charisma checks and bribes and that kind of thing. But you, I think that's an interesting limitation here is that they are in the middle of a big city. So the fact that they have to follow the law and do things lawfully, even if they're not a lawful character, uh, is important. But I would vastly recommend, I mean, Session Zero in general, always have that to just know, like, what your group wants to get out of the adventure and your style as DM and, you know, it's like a first date. Like, you need to set those ground rules down. <laughs> um, very much important in this one, though, is you need to mention the fact that Waterdeep is a city of laws and and the player characters will need to follow those laws uh, for sure. Um, let's go and look at the Waterdeep map, though, because that is probably the best part of this campaign. And it's... Thank goodness it's good because I think the majority of the campaign... Uh, experience will be spent staring at this map, and at least when it comes to one good visual map, uh, this one is good. <laughs> uh, the actual, you know, individual battle maps are bad, but this Waterdeep map itself is is very good. As I lag around trying to show it to you, of course it would do this while I'm trying to do my review. 
Um, I'm a big fan of Lords of Waterdeep, the board game. I have played it for years, and I continue to literally play it every day on my iPad uh, with friends. Uh, it's a fantastic game, so it's really fun for me to sit here and look at all the like buildings I recognize. And you know, I'm not super well versed in Forgotten Realms lore, but I feel like I really know Waterdeep because of that game. And uh, the representation here is very fun. It's it's neat. You can see all the things, and you can see all the things happen um, through the you know written descriptions and events. You can find them here on the map, which is a lot of fun. I just wish so hard, so badly that the other battle maps were given the. Uh, the attention to detail and the love and artwork that this map was given because this map is fantastic and it I'm glad it is because you spent a good chunk of your time on this map this map can, does not come up not be battled on it's not even to scale like a lot of the times when they do uh, when roll 20 does the overland maps they will go ahead and put it to scale to where you drag it across and it'll show like the miles or whatever this one doesn't even do that so it's very much just a picture you're supposed to look at I don't think there's a single actual token on this map which it's a little disappointing. I didn't necessarily expect that, so I don't think it's, I'm going to put that as a con, but uh, it's it's a nice map to look at for sure. So chapter two, then, is just the players get their estate, and they get approached by a bunch of different factions. And this this section, and really this whole adventure, feels a little too Adventures league to me. Where, like, all of these factions... I don't know, and I, maybe you can tell me in the comments if, if you... Uh, if you use the factions in your games, because it always felt like it was a very much an Adventurers League thing, is that you like get renown and you get prestige with your faction. Like, does, does do people care about that in their own? If they're just running their own games, even in the Forgotten Realms, do they care? Like, I've used the factions for sure, but I never really cared in terms of, you know, you're part of this faction and you're working for them, and this is you're earning renown and your renown gives you this and that kind of thing. It seems strange. And the other strange thing here is that. Are the players supposed to all join different factions? And if so, because there's a whole list here of different little side quests uh, you can do, which originally I was kind of excited about this. Like, all right, this is kind of like Skyrim-ish, where there's all these different, you know, factions, and you can choose which ones you want to join and which, you know, quests you want to progress. But the truth is they're really very minimalized, like... There's not a lot going on here. Each one has essentially one major NPC that is your contact. Um, and most of these are pretty well known. I think Emerald, Enclave, Harpers, Lords Alliance, Order of the Gauntlets, and Tarn. Those are all pretty... I think Force Grey is the Defenders. Like These are all pretty common factions in the lore. Uh, and each one has a is scaled for, depending on what party level you are, which tells me that you're supposed to do these throughout the rest of the campaign, just... Occasionally, the your faction leader will contact you basically as you level up, uh, and then give you a side quest. Which, you know, some of them are fine. They're they're really easy, and most of them don't require combat at all. They're just like a skill check or just going to talking to somebody. Almost seem like busy work, but obviously a DM could flesh it out. This one involves talking to a talking horse and just getting some information from that horse. Uh, some of them involve actually fighting something. This one is a a gazer, which is literally a like dog-sized beholder and smaller than that um interviewing a bunch of doppelgangers here uh there's one of them that was fighting some uh like devils um uh, it's the zentarum one had a bit more clandestine things involved yeah the sp uh, spine devils for the order of the gauntlet um but the weird thing is like are, are characters supposed to be in different factions and is it just those uh, characters that are doing these quests, or do those, does the party help those characters, and does everybody get renowned, and how does that work exactly? I'm not too sure, and I'm not, I've not played Adventures League, I just do my own group, and this just feels, as someone that hasn't done this much into the factions in terms of the mechanics of it, you know, with the renown and the rewards and all that, um, this just feels very Adventure League to me, and again, not something that I necessarily wanted in my campaign book. You want to put that in the Adventures League material? That's totally fine. That's what it's there for. But this feels like it's something that just is, and maybe that's just not for me. Um, but it's a very weird chapter. You basically just get there like starting one or two quests and they can just get all these. I have a feeling that a lot of the DMs Guild supplemental material will be for this chapter too because it's just like, how do you what do you do here? Like, <laughs> There's no real narrative. Literally nothing happens in the main story. It is just these factions approach the characters. The characters are supposed to get settled in Waterdeep and get more of an incentive to be in Waterdeep and hang out there, and that's it. Like, 
nothing happens until chapter three, and chapter three literally kicks off an explosion, which is a fireball happens like right outside their house, and there's a bunch of dead bodies. And it's a murder investigation, which is great. That's cool. That's almost how I would prefer just to start the adventure off, although I can see why they want to do the newbie, like, level one thing, because screw level one. Let's get the players out of that level as quick as we can and get them to level two or three, whatever chapter three is. Um, and this explosion happens. <laughs> Look at that cool handout. Um, oh, the artwork is good. They always do good artwork here. Um, and there's a bunch of dead bodies, and essentially it is an investigation the players can take part in, although they have to be careful. The city watch is going to be right there, too, and, you know, you can't be snooping around too much. Um, and they find that there's this construct that uh, has attacked a uh, an associate of Neverembers who was carrying the stone of Gon... I want to say Gondor, but something... Um, was trying to get, uh, trying to smuggle it out of the city because it's the key to the vault, and all these things happen. All these people want to get this stone now. That is the MacGuffin item, is the stone which can tell you where the vault is and then what keys you need to open that, to open the vault. And chapter three is just figuring out where this uh, construct is and where the um, stone has ended up, and it basically leads you to the Growlhund Villa, and then from there is when you have to make the decision, again, as the DM, basically, which villain you actually want to be behind all this. Before they make it to the Growlhund Villa, you need to know who was actually behind it, because the players... And what's weird is the players can actually choose to just send the City Watch there, and then the City Watch will just do that mini-dungeon, essentially, and then come back and tell you a bunch of things, which, of course, a lot of it is a lie, because Growlhund just lied to the City Watch. Um, we can switch to that map. Notice how I'm not showing you these maps, because I don't want to show these maps. They're really bad-looking. <laughs> um, and then at some point in chapter 3 you will need to decide which uh, let's see where's Grahan Villa uh, which actual season and villain you want to do and it's each one is tied I did not click that roll 20 oh my gosh I want the Grahan Villa please um, and they're tied to the seasons and for whatever reason, I guess, because they just wanted four villains. Technically, they place during the different seasons, I guess, so that's fine. Um, and you can see there's different uh, tokens on the GM layer that you can use, but here's the actual villa, which is a very... just... it's a building. Um, for the purposes of this review, this is the spring copy. Uh, and again, roll 20, it only loads in one of them. So you're... I say one third, it might even be half. Somewhere around one third to one half of the adventure changes depending on which path you want to take. But the weird thing is, a lot of the maps are the same. It's just that they are completely remixed. You know what it reminds me of? Is Dragon Age 2. When Dragon Age 2 came out, it came out really quick and it was. It was a high complaint with that game that they reused a lot of their assets. So they, it was the same dungeon. You'd literally see the same, like, cave dungeon used, but they would just seal off some doors and just open others. And, like, oh, it's, a new, it's a different dungeon now, and it's, like, literally it's the exact same thing, but you can tell they just literally open and close some doors. That's kind of what's used here, except, obviously, the players haven't seen these maps before. They don't see the same maps because you choose, okay, which path do you want to take? And then uh, those same maps are used. So it's for the DM's angle you might see it like that, but the players aren't going to see it like that. Uh, and then they go through Chapter 4, which, uh, again, it, it depends entirely on which ones you want to choose. So the spring... And it really it depends on... You, you find the construct. Uh, I think in the beginning of Chapter 4, you can finally locate him. You actually gain, gain a device at some point that literally tracks like the construct around the city, and you can fly around in a griffin and try to find it. And then on its map, it's got an X showing where it delivered the stone to. And then that's when you choose the path about, okay, where did he de deliver the stone to? It's one of these four locations, depending on which villain you want to use. Um, and the spring one uses the Xanathar, which uh, I have only looked at spring and summer. Um, those are the review copies that I got. I don't really need all four of them to review this thing, but um, just looking at it, Summer did actually seem a lot more interesting. The storyline there. I mean, the Xanathar is cool. Beholders are cool. But it's just a very standard, like, the stone was actually the, the Xanathar is to begin with. So it's just trying to steal it back. So it's not a whole lot of interesting motivation there. Whereas the Summer one has the Castanalars. Castanalars. Um, 
which is this noble uh, family who was on like the brink of bankruptcy and they traded away, they literally sold their souls to the devil, sold their children's souls to the devil, uh, as, as to the devil, as, as Medeus, um, in order to uh, get back onto their financial gains. <laughs> and uh, they immediately lost their eldest son and their two youngest will be, uh, they'll lose them. Uh, to the demons, like, coming up in a couple days, so they've got this big plot to, like, you know, that's why they have to get the Vault of the Dragon. That, that's cool motivation. Like, that's something that's you have to wrestle with as a player. Like, if you learn all that, you're like, oh, man, they're trying to steal all this money, and, unfortunately, the other half is to kill 100 people uh, by poisoning them in this feast um, in order to save the lives of their children. But the parents also made the decision to damn them, so it's like, well, how do you trade those lives or whatever? That's a cool, conflicting storyline there, and already way more interesting and compelling uh, than the Xanathars, which is just a very standard, like, he's just gang warfare, essentially trading territory, and he just wants this stone and gold for himself because he's a beholder. Um, so, just out of those two, the summer is way more interesting. I have not looked at the others, although Jarlaxle, for the fall one, seems like a really, really fun uh, character, for sure, and some neat stuff going on there. Um, so I couldn't tell you which one is actually the best, because I have not looked at all of them. But the weird thing is... And you can see here, the way it's added up here is you go into these encounters. So it's it's a section, it's a series of encounters. And before this, you know, Chapter 2 is very open um, in terms of all these factions approach. And you have all these little, like, side quest things you can do. And then all of a sudden, once this investigation starts and the fireball explode explosion happens, it's actually pretty linear. You actually go from basically one encounter to the next... Um, pretty much back to back like they're almost set up like there's a chase sequence you find something out uh in this case you go to this mist shore which is actually it would be a cool map if it didn't look like a piece of shit <laughs> it's like this docks map um and you meet up with this uh, uh this person who's got this giant uh, like submarine apparatus which is really neat uh i'm gonna sh show you this map because it's it's such a squandered opportunity um the way they even put the apparatus on there was that Miss Shore. And you can see it's actually labeled Miss Shore Spring, Mausoleum Spring, because those maps are basically the same in the other ones, but they will be all the tokens will be completely different, and all the the situation will be different. So, given that that's how uh, Wizards did it, I think Roll Twenty doing it as different modules worked really well. You can see automatically like, this would be a really cool looking map if it didn't look like it was just a bunch of you know black lines everywhere. And again, if you like this style, let me know. I'm very interested if this speaks to you and why. And maybe I just don't have that nostalgic background with D&D. &D. Um, but this, I mean, look at this, this right here, especially the actual apparatus thing, looks so dumb. It looks like somebody just doodled in a notebook. It's, uh, I don't know. Um, but it's, the sequence, it's not bad, and it's a fun, like, MacGuffin. There's, what... The adventure does well. Is it is it has the feeling of the city being very alive and reactive, and the players are kind of along for the ride, um, which has the advantage of making it so... You know, a lot of problem with even open-world video games is that you feel like the world is frozen until the player enters that thing, and then the world starts reacting to you only in, like, a localized sphere. So, like, in Skyrim, you know, and I keep using Skyrim as the example, because everybody's played that game. It's an easy one to use an example of. Like, they tell you, oh, this dragon's attacking the city over here. We need to go save it. And they're like, all right, I'll be sure to do that. And then you just spend, you know, a week doing whatever little shit you want to do, exploring dungeons whatever. And then by the, when you ever make it to that city, finally, oh, now the dragon's attacking. You know, that kind of thing. It's not like you get there and, like, oh, the dragon laid waste to the city, and it's destroyed and all that. This one obviously doesn't have anything extreme like that, but it feels like... There are things happening, and that's something that D&D &D can obviously do that a video game can't very well, is that um, things will happen even if the players don't do it, you know, aren't involved, and it feels like, especially with the way the factions are battling each other, the two biggest ones are the, are the Zentarum uh, and the Xanathar, uh, whatever the Xanathar's guild is. Uh, those two factions, like, at war with each other, like, straight up, like, open gang warfare, and it's really fun to be able to see that. Like, so a lot of times when the players show up somewhere they will already see, like, dead bodies and, like, things happened, which feels very cool. It feels like there's things happening in the city and the players are, you know, almost creates, like, a, a sense of tension and, and time sensitivity without having, like, an overarching, like, oh, you have four days to do this. It's like, no, shit's happening, like, right now and people are getting murdered in front of you and 
I think it does that part really well. But the weird thing is it does make for a very railroady linear experience because they're literally going from like one chase sequence to one area to one area to the next. Now, a few times it does mention like if they lose the trail, then they may have to do this weird thing of like, okay, you have to like pause the action and let the players go ask questions or do some, you know, ear to the ground detective work and all that kind of thing to figure out where the le- where their next step is and that's the nice thing about having that troll skull uh, alley location is they literally have like all these assets they have all these friendly NPCs there's a Rakshasa um, detective that, that runs a place called like the Tiger Eye and it's there for that exact purposes like he can help them like if they get stuck somewhere there's like a dragonborn librarian and all these different like nice assets and amenities the players can use ultimately the goal is to figure out where the Vault of the Dragons is, which is when you finally get the stone, and again, it, cha- it like all these encounters and, and maps and things, it is just them trying to get the stone. You finally get the stone, somebody attunes to it, it tells you what keys you need, which that part's pretty cool, because the keys can be just random shit, and the key isn't a physical uh, thing, it can be a person. Um, let's see, where am I looking at? Chapter 4, Vault Keys. And I did kind of like... Uh, this a lot because it really was like an outside of the box thinking where the key can be just whatever okay they give you a hole oh wait no that's not that's encounter chains that is also not what I clicked roll 20 oh my goodness hopefully it will not be lagging when you are playing on this game okay vault keys um here we go Roll three times once for each key so the first key is one of these second key and third key and it can be something really tough to get like a bronze dragon scale or something silly like a performance of your beardy face which is a dwarven love song <laughs> or a gift from a queen you know something interesting a beholder eye stock which the funny thing about that is there is like a toy shop um, that the players meet early on in the game that has like a stuffed beholder outside so that'd be a fun one if somebody remembered that you know if you had that as one of the keys like oh we could just use that you know can we use like a just a stuffed toy beholder eye stock yes you can because you're thinking outside of the box you have to use a little beholder eye stock so I like that a lot um, a drunken elf and that literally just says any elf that's been poisoned by alcohol can be used for this that's really clever and I think that's a funny way of doing it um, once they have the keys they gain access to the vault and the vault is the closest thing you have to a probably the closest thing you have to a dungeon crawl with the exception that the villain layers are definitely dungeon crawls but and this is an odd twist the game basically ends after the vault of the dragon so that whole chapter four is getting to the vault and then the vault is actually included in chapter four and then chapter five six seven eight is the villains and their vaults and the are the villains and their layers sorry layers and their villain layers are basically not actually used like i guess if the players get captured at some point or for some reason they want to track the villain to their lair, or if the villain does acquire the stone, the players do a really bad job of, of acquiring the piece that they need, then they might have to go to the lair and you can get really complicated, but the players are basically not meant to go to these lairs because, again, they're like fourth level. Like, that's pretty hard. You can see here this Vault of the Dragons is really the closest thing, and there's the main door here, and there's just not much going out here. This reminds me of Storm King's Thunder, which is very large and kind of empty. Um... There's this one section of, like, crumbling bridges, and there's some traps in here, which these traps are, are very nice in the descriptions. And there's all of one enemy... Well, that was a black pudding. One enemy, which is the a uh, gold dragon, um, Aranax, who guards it, and the players... Have, there's a bunch of options to deal with Aranax, which is uh, nifty. Um, they can talk to him. They can bluff with him. Uh, you can try to fight him, but it's not going to be a good idea, because he's a fucking dragon, and you're, like, fourth level. Um, so the the real encounter is that when you make it out of this... I clicked on something a while ago. It's still not popping up. Um, the real encounter is that when you... There's the picture. Uh, when you make it back out, either with the gold or without the gold, uh, then you actually meet the, uh, the villains that have been essentially hounding you this whole time. There we go. All to the dragons. I'm going to scroll down and there's a blank. Um, and that is essentially the uh, boss fight, I believe. And I think if they... Let's see, remove the gold. Where are we at here? Adventure conclusion. Well, let's see, adventure conclusion. Leaving the vault, yeah. So if uh, the actual villain doesn't appear, it's it's the villain's, like... Um, well, except for uh, Jarlax, it actually does appear. Um, the rest of them uh, just have a little army force that appears. 
and attack the characters, and then they can try to survive, and then uh, they can choose what they want to do after that, essentially. They can give the gold back or, you know, whatever they want to do, but they essentially establish themselves as big players in Waterdeep. You know, they make fifth level. They've entered that tier two sphere. It just feels like it's so much of a starter you know, adventure, like I'm Lost Mine of Fandelver, and it even has this tease at the end of Under Mountain Beckon, see with the Yawning Portal. But that feels very weird for a full $50 book that, again, is is priced and modeled along with these full, full campaign books. You know, the, the Storm King's Thunder, the Tomb of Annihilation, the Straw, Out of the Abyss, all of those. And this one is not that. It is, you are first level through fifth level. You are a strongly tier one adventure. This is made to be a newbie adventure. Now, the nice thing is you don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, go to um, the, the Undermount adventure after this. This one does tell a, a complete story, more or less. So you could just do this as an intro adventure if you want to do more of an urban adventure. So that is an advantage. But I was pretty shocked that... I was pretty shocked because it also said that Dungeon of the Mad Mage would go up to 20th level, and it says right here. Well, I was like, man, that means that... Is that one a 6th through 20th, or is that going to be like a 10th through 20th, and the players are supposed to have assumed to have leveled up in that time between? And if it is, then, boy, let's get those DMs Guild uh, books in there. That's going to be a huge opportunity for for all of those. Um, but it's, it's I don't know, it's very weird the way this is structured. And, and as you can tell, like, nowhere here do the players actually go to the villain layers, and the villain layers is a major part of those uh, seasonal differences because they're all very unique dungeons, fairly high-level dungeons that the players aren't really supposed to be able to survive or do because, again, they're basically optional. Um, and you can see, I'll, I can show this one too. So the the side encounters, they're, they're not mapped, but Roll20 does give you uh, the tokens here uh, for when they're used for whatever. I mean, you've got all, the, you have a full token page to use them anyway, and with any of these uh, creatures, you can sit there and drag and drop uh, whatever uh, creature you need. I'm not doing a lot of that now because Roll20 is lagging like crazy. Um, but yeah, like the Xanathar's Lair, you're thinking, oh man, this is so cool, the Xanathar's Lair, and it's not used in the story basically at all. Like, it's there. It does mention that the you DMs could use it in the next adventure because the next adventure take, takes place in Waterdeep or, you know, beneath Waterdeep at some point. And the players will probably have to use, you know, these various faction leaders, even the villains, for the next adventure, so fine, but... You know, it's a cool map, it's a cool looking map, and it feels weird to not use this at all, but again, your players are probably 4th or 5th level and would not probably be able to handle this, certainly wouldn't be able to handle fighting the Xanathar. So, it, it's very weird. Um, let's go over my pros and cons for uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. <laughs> my con right now is Roll20 needs to stop lagging so much. Um... So, Pro, the gigantic map of Waterdeep is wonderfully detailed and beautifully drawn. I do legit like this map a lot. It's a great map, and I do think you would spend the majority of your action, you know, all those side quests, all those little faction things. There's so many of these things that don't have a map at all. You would just be staring at this in terms of in your Roll20. And thankfully, this map is very, very nice. And, I mean, you will be on this map a good chunk of the time. So, it's good to have a good map here. Uh, pro, the city and the events in the story feel very reactive and alive with multiple factions in direct competition with one another. As I said, like you'll show up somewhere and you'll see dead bodies or see people already in combat. Um, you, you feel like you're part of a larger world, or in this case, just a city that's alive with different you know, factions happening and not everybody. You know, you, it does kind of make the, the heroes slightly less of the center of attention, but I think it works very well in this case because the, the hero, the PCs are, you know, lower level, and there are things going on around them that's that they're just trying to catch up to. So I think it works. I think it all works pretty well. Uh, pro early on, the PCs are rewarded with their own base of operations in Waterdeep. That's that Troll Skull Manor, uh, which serves as an, as an excellent means of giving them additional resources, friendly NPC allies, and real ties to the city. Normally, I would balk at giving level one players their own freaking place of residence. There was another adventure I reviewed on the DMs Guild. Uh, that did that at level one. I thought that was crazy, but here it works really well, and it's important because you need to give the players that uh, tie to, um, uh, to to Waterdeep. You want to give them the stakes in there, and I think giving them uh, their own residence and then having that explosion take place outside, like all of that, involves the players in some really fun ways and gives them gives them some nice resources and um, NPCs and friends to talk to. So I think that's a really good uh, way of tying them into Waterdeep. Pro, the interactive GM campaign page helps you stay organized with where the PCs are in the narrative. 
it's not, you know, super necessary. It's that page where you can move the token around and see where they are. But it is nice to have that full visualization of, okay, okay where the players are and what happens beat to beat to beat. It is obviously all here in the journal, but it, it can be nice to have a GM page where you're just doing on that uh, as well. That's a nice little addition that Roll20 does. The cons. The ink graph maps look awful. <laughs> and I think they translate very poorly to a digital table format like Roll20. If I wanted to roll this run this adventure if I really loved the story and I thought man the only bad thing is the maps I would have to sit here and do all the work to redo these maps or you know I say redo it I would find somebody that redid them and then put that into roll 20 and put all the tokens in there and all the dynamic lighting and things in place myself I would not in a million years use those maps as they are I think they are bad and then I do not like them one bit uh, con much of the last one third and I'm kind of guessing with one third of the adventure is divided into four separate stories only one of which you're supposed to actually use. I don't like that system at either. I didn't like that part of Storm King's Thunder. Uh, I don't like it when the DMs Guild gives you, you know, a bunch of things, or the DMs Guild, when the when Wizards of the Coast gives you a bunch of things and says, okay, here's, you know, all these options, but you're only going to do one. Like, I let me make that decision. Give me all the options and say, here's all the things you can run at once if you want, and then I can pick and choose what I want to run. <laughs> um... In this case, it feels weird, and it feels weird because it would be better if the PCs were actually making that choice. If and and maybe I think a good DM could layer in all these different factions in some neat ways, um, introduce these characters in some neat ways, and see like which ones your players want to do. But I think as written, and I have not, you know, read it cover to cover. And it's kind of difficult to do in Roll Twenty in general, but as written it feels like it's mainly the dm making that choice like which one does the dm want to do and reveal as the villain in which case the only advantage i can see on that is as i mentioned if you are a dm running this for multiple groups and you just wanted to make it more fun for yourself and be able to do it in different ways but again that's only that last section um but you know i think roll 20 implemented it in a, in a good way which is doing it the different module add-ons uh, con, the nifty villain layers, which are nifty, aren't really used in the story at all, even though they're completely mapped out. So they're really cool maps for all these uh, villainous layers. They are included in this adventure, but they're not really used in the main campaign at all. The actual adventure uh, pretty much just ends at that vault. Um, also, con, the adventure ends until the follow-up book. I don't, you know, if that if that's considered a full campaign story, then I guess it will be looking at them together in the future, but for now it ends at basically level 4, I think they reach level 5 at the end, which puts Dragon Heist closer to Lost Mine of Phandelver than any of the main published campaign books. But it's priced like a main campaign book, which is kind of not cool to me. <laughs> I just feel like you're not getting enough content out of there. Um, and I think lower level D&D, especially level 1 and 2, is just... I think a lot of DMs and a lot of players want to get out of those levels as quickly as possible um, because there's just not much you can do threat-wise and there's not much you have power-wise and the fact that you kind of relish in those levels here isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it still it very much limits like what the players and limits what the DM can do. And you know, I guess that's a w one way you can do an urban adventure is if you want to have the, have the entire adventure happen in a city, you need to keep the players low enough level to be able to respect the law and not be able to just break all the rules with high-level magic spells and that kind of thing. So I can maybe see the balance uh, aspect from it at that point, but not too much of a fan. So, final verdict for Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Let's go back to the main page. Roll 20... Please don't. There we go. <laughs> Final verdict. The zany, crime-filled mysteries create a compelling urban narrative, but the poor maps and ultimately shallow content make Waterdeep Dragon Heist a difficult campaign to recommend. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. You can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much.